Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, what I want to do is take you on a journey of self-discovery. Not mine. Well, who knows how this video will turn out. No, it's for the people in this story, and it's a, it's really a story about beliefs. Beliefs in things greater than, than yourself, like maybe, um, I don't know, pieces of paper. Well, one person in this story was obsessed with, and I mean like, like to the max, obsessed with tarot cards. Whatever the card says, it goes, so buckle up. It is to Westminster we go, uh, located in Colorado, and there, a young woman named Lee Porter, she tried to, she moved there, you know, to start fresh, uh, to start, start again. But it went rotten, like, real quick. So right, uh, I kind of think that's, that about does it. Uh, this story's wild, so let's give it a goo. So this whole story takes us to the city of Westminster. Big C. The camera's reversed, so should I be doing that? Big CO. Great things are definitely going down town with businesses opening up in downtown Westminster. It's in central Colorado. Really, it's part of the Denver metro area and is home to over 100,000 people, if you can believe that. It's a place where, if you're looking for a job making jars, you can get one. The Ball Corporation is there, along with other high-tech shenanigans, and it's a fast-growing city, you better keep up. Though, that kind of comes with, you know, crime rates also growing, so... Boo earns. But you know what, overall, it's nice, it's safe, it's, it's friggin' lovely, so it is, lads, I'm mad about it. My new favourite place. Now enough about that, who cares? What we do care about is the story of Lee Porter, who went missing in the city of Westminster, in the year 2014. See, Lee wasn't long in Westminster. She just arrived and things went off the rails pretty quickly. Wrong crowd sort of deal. You know, when people, some people, they'll approach you as your friend and it turns out <clears throat> they got some pretty evil shit behind them, like real sick shit. But who was Lee Porter? I'll answer that for you now. Lee Porter was born in 1994, the younger sister to older brother Max and daughter of Renee Jackson. She grew up in Cotopaxi, southern Colorado, about three hours from Denver and a blink and you'll miss it sort of place. If you're not there for the whitewater rafting along the Arkansas River, you're surely there for the Cotopaxi General Store slash gas station slash restaurant. Honestly, it looks, it looks beautiful, but it, I think you can understand why Lee would want to be out of there. Lee and Max, they were like glue. They were like two things that stick together really well. I can't think of anything right now, but they were like that. He was protective of her, and he always kept an eye on his little sis. They both attended Cotopaxi High School, a very small school for a very small population in a very big place. The mountains are big, the sky is big, and Lee had a big personality. She liked school, well, she liked the social aspect of it anyway. The hit the books part, maybe not so much, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Which in her case, you know, like mine, and probably a lot of you, means you're just gonna do enough to get by and that's it. Not just me, our education system needs to be updated for the modern world, come on guys. Lee was outgoing, friendly, warm, gregarious, and she had many friends. She was popular wherever she went, and generally just got on. She was a people person. Lee didn't always have like the best judgement, but you know what? She always had older brother Max to fall back on, he would be there if she got, you know, in too deep, in too much trouble, he would always be there and have her back. But in 2013, uh, Max, he graduated, you know, community college, he got his degree, uh, he got his degree in massage therapy, and he left town. See, the Porters were originally from California, and I guess he was going back home to start up a business, a business there. And Lee, you know, who always looked up to him, she went to the same college he did, she did the same course in massage therapy uh, that he did. The plan was, you know, he went back to California to set up a, like a massage kind of, you know, therapy business. And the plan was that she, once she got her own degree, would join him in said business. But that's not what happened. See, she started getting a little bit depressed in college, away from her brother, her friends, her life that she had left behind. Now, it is common enough, I would say, you know, for people who move away for school and for college to get depressed being away from their home. But with her, it was like, 
it was really bad. It struck her a little bit harder than most. She was now in this town called Trinidad in Colorado, and there's not really a whole lot going on there, so Lee was probably just staring at the four walls most of the time. But it was there that she met a guy, I hear... Doves? Yeah, I hear him, guys. He, I, more like... What's like a shitty bird? That's the sound I gotta put in there. His name was Jesse. And he seems like he just walked out of a Limp Bizkit concert in 1997. In his mind, he probably did, because he was in his 30s. Lee was 18 years old, alone, naive, you know, um, vulnerable. So this winner winner made a dog's dinner of Lee's entire plans. She stopped going to class, she moved in with this all-star, and then it turned out that this Jesse was a bit of a fiend for the LH dog. Heroin. She then dropped out of college, she still had the debt for paying for college, and she had uh, an addiction now. So things kind of spiraled, spiraled, were, were spiraled. Shockingly, it turned out this guy kinda sucked. Who could have known? They would fight, and now with no college, no family or friends around her, and a shitty boyfriend, Lee decided to leave. All she got out of the deal was a heroin addiction and a mountain of debt. So it was in early June 2014 that Lee upped and she left. She went to where I was talking about at the very beginning, if you do recall, the city of Westminster. It's really always hard not to call it Westminster. Kind of just automatically say that. Almost immediately, she went missing. Max, he couldn't get true to her. And you know, even though he lived on the coast, he had kind of been in constant contact with her, and Lee's mother had kind of been kept in the dark about, you know, about exactly what Lee had been going through um, during her time in college, and you know, her, her things were just not, were just not great for her. But when he told her all about this, worry spread like wildfire. Lee's mother Renee, she still paid for her phone bills, so she had access to who Lee had last been speaking to before she went missing. The last she'd been heard from was on the 3rd of June, and there was two numbers that were like at the very bottom of the list as the last ones she had called. So Renee, she called up these two numbers, you know, who had Lee last been speaking to before she stopped speaking to anyone. One was a hotel just outside Denver. Uh, it turned out that Lee and Jesse, they'd spend the night together on the 2nd of June in a hotel room. So that was a, you know, Lee, I guess, had called to make the, the booking. The other number she called was to a guy named Christopher Chris Wade. He said she had been to his place on the 3rd of June, and he lived in Westminster. Lee had gone to Westminster without really knowing anybody there and any plans or where she was going to stay, so so Chris, he said he spoke to Lee um, and offered, hey, you want to crash, crash with me? Go ahead. Now, the reason Chris knew Lee and how they had actually begun contacting was that Christopher Wade was Cotopaxi represent. He was a local. He went to school with Max and with Lee. He was a homeboy of the Porters. Um, now they didn't exactly know each other super well, but you know, Facebook friends or whatever, like acquaintances. Chris told Renee that, uh, yeah, you know, Lee, she was living out of her car, so he had offered her like a place to crash, you know, rest those dogs. But, uh, you know, they hung out for a couple of, couple of hours and then she, she was off again to parts unknown. Chris, he was a sharp cookie. Uh, he did well in school. After school, he joined He joined up with the military. And now he was studying criminal justice in Denver. Don't they always study criminal justice? Bit of a, you know, like one of these. A weird O. Uh, an odd guy. I mean, come on, just look at him. Would you feel comfortable around this man? I wouldn't drink anything he gave me. Uh, let's put it that way. Renee, she called the police. She told them about both. Um, Chris and Jesse. So Chris Wade telling talking to the police, he said um, he he got in touch with 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 Lee when she had made a Facebook post asking, "Hey, anybody have a place to crash?" And he he replied to her message saying, "Yeah." She came over, they hung out, they went and they got a bite to eat, and then she got some kind of some kind of text. Chris didn't know from who, and she left. She got in a white van or a white truck with some stranger, and off she went. Now, Lee Porter's car was still near his house, all her belongings inside. Now, parts of his story could be validated because, because Lee's car was in his car park. So she definitely had arrived to his place. But, you know, Chris was saying she left with somebody else. He had no idea who and never heard from her again. 
Okay. Porter's family hired a private investigator who says they pinpointed four search locations, all bodies of water, based on the pings from Porter's cell phone. They plan to take the cadaver dog teams to those areas with the hope of finding Lee. I uh, say a prayer for her. Um, ask God to help us find her. And that will help me. A search began for Lee. The posters went up, checking everywhere in Westminster. Max, he flew in from California to help with the search. The two people the police were looking at were Jesse and Chris. Jesse, though, was, was pleading his innocence. In fact, at the time, he was in Maryland at a drug rehabilitation center. He may well have been with Lee on the 2nd of June, but by the time Chris says he saw Lee, Jesse was out of state. The police could pretty quickly back up um, his alibi and stuff that, you know, whatever happened to Lee happened after he had left. Days would go by with no word on where Lee had gone and with whom. Had she even gotten into a strange- had she even been with Chris? Like, we have no confirmation anything about his story is true. And Chris would speak with KCNC, Colorado's news channel. What is Chrissy? Chrissy boy, watch it, watch it Chrissy. What does he have to say? Overall, she seemed pretty depressed, and while she was smiling, it didn't really go to her eyes. So that kind of was weirding me out to see her like that. So, riddle me this. Uh, have you ever seen a man's mind go a million miles a minute? Well, you're about to. Yeah, she said she was tired and she just wanted to crash, so I said okay. And she... Uh, we were... I found some of her uh, drugs and confronted her about it that night. Then, shortly afterwards, she took off. And... I didn't really think much of it. I thought she was just angry at me because I was uh, playing the part of the concerned friend. Riddle me this, number two. Is this a normal thing to say? Because I don't think it is. I don't really have very many friends, but the friends I do have, I'm very loyal to. So even losing one is a heavy blow for me. What an odd man. I'd say to her that I'm sorry that she, that if she thought that I was angry at her for, uh, for doing drugs, but I want her to be safe, and I want her to know that I want the best for her. A week after Lee's disappearance, the police did a search of Chris's apartment. It was a SHIT shit hole. Not only that, dear Chris over here, he had a new story. This time, he said Lee started to get funky with him, but he said at some point during the funkiness, she had a, she had a nosebleed. Um, she had a nosebleed, guys, so, you know, blood coming out of, her, out of her schnoz. If you see blood anywhere, it's from the nosebleed, guys. I told you about it, so now you know. You don't have to do any investigating. He said he had to throw the sheets out um, of the room because of the nosebleed and also it definitely didn't have anything to do with that big old knife you'll find right beside my bed. I'm telling you about it now guys so you know I'm being honest. Honest Chris over here. They also found in his apartment a receipt for bleach and rubber gloves. These were bought early on the 4th of June. Nothing Chris said was correct. And if there's one thing Chris loves doing more, even than telling, like, untruth lies, um, it's sign. It's really annoying. And probably last opportunity to do this voluntarily. I maintain my innocence, but I would like a lawyer. <sighs> but he said nada, nothing. And the police didn't have anything to link him to whatever happened to Lee. He shut down the interview, and so they let him go. Lee's phone would eventually be traced to a dump nearby, and after a major search, it was found, along with some of her other items. Her body, though, if there, they didn't find it. I mean, they let him go, but like, not really, because he was put under police surveillance. 
after all, um, if he did have something to do with Lee Porter's disappearance, as we see time and time again, there's a fair old chance now, you know what I mean? He'll go back to whatever he did, wherever he put her. He'll go back there. In the meantime, Lee's family were in maximum search mode. They hadn't come close to giving up and they were there every day desperately trying to find Lee Porter. And Max, he was there too, and he was right up front. And he started talking more with Chris. Trying to see if his story changed, you know, anything new. Sully, it did. Uh, so, like, small, small changes here and there in Chris's story. Maybe it started like this, oh wait, no. It started like this when you'd ask him the next day. And remember, there's like that old saying, if you're telling the truth, you never need to remember anything. Well, it seemed like Chris needed to remember a lot. But Max was like, sweet talk, I'm old buddy, old pal, you know, trying to become his confidant. You know, uh, just like the one person you might not want to be your confidant is the victim's brother. But hey, he tried. It actually worked. Now, a few things about Chrissy. Uh, one being Lee must have been absolutely at her wits end. She must have been desperate to go and speak with him and meet up with him. Now, Chris had been like kind of Facebook stalking Lee for, for a time after they became friends. They became friends on Facebook. They didn't really know each other in person, but Chris would like, uh, you okay, hun? Liking her fucking status, every t everything she posted, any pictures she posted, like, like, it's like, you know, when you get a note, it's like, oh, that, that person's liked everything I've ever done. That's weird. He was like messaging her as if he wanted to be her white knight, you know? I can fix you, babe. Weird. There's a lot of weird about Wade, <laughs> actually, so it's good thing his name rhymes. In high school, Max had heard, Max had heard, like, again, they were in the same, uh, year, but they weren't friends. Probably because Max had heard some weird shit about Christopher Wade. Apparently Chris would keep journals about, you know, fantasizing, about capturing and keeping women as sex slaves and that sort of thing. Chris had spent time in the military. It was something he never really spoke of very much. Not for the reason a lot of people in the military don't speak about it. No, his reason for not speaking about it was because he was discharged. Uh, what happened while uh, he was in the military was that he... Um, he had told a psychologist, an army psychologist, that he had tried to kidnap a woman while in high school. Yeah, twice. He had attempted, he literally attempted to kidnap, molest, and murder a young girl while he was in high school. He even attempted it. He even attempted it twice. Like, it's not just like he thought about doing it. He broke into their home where a young girl was living to kidnap her. And both times he got into the house and he got scared off. Uh, one time by, by someone was going to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, so he ran. Another time by a dog. So the military were like, uh, out. And when the police searched his place, they found he was a peruser of a violent, um, child. You know. He also enjoyed wearing women's underwear? Um, I mean, hey, I guess I'll, <laughs> don't knock until I try it. I, uh, I'm good though. I'll stick with my, uh, <clears throat> boxer briefs. I'm good, thanks. And one thing about Chris was that he was... He adored tarot cards, the old Major Arcanum or whatever. He loved um, deciphering his destiny, reading out these cards. He obviously wasn't reading them close enough uh, because he deciphered jack shit about what would happen. He sat down once with Max and with Jesse. See, what happened was that Max felt that Chris was going to tell him something. So he called Jesse, who flew from Maryland, where he was in uh, rehab. And so Max and Jesse were like, listen, we're going to confront, confront. Chris. He's not going to tell him about himself, so he needs a bit of prodding. Chris, Max, and Jesse, they sat down uh, in this city park in Westminster under the pretense of, hey, Chris, do your, do your tarot reading. Maybe we can decipher something about what happened to Lee. Give it a goo. The police were actually there too, uh, you know, watching Chris, but nobody knew it. So Chris got out the deck. Let's see if we can find Lee. Max recorded it all on his phone. Air, earth, fire, water, spirit, tentacles. The deck could be saying about um, some of the perceptions of me, or it could be just indicating that there's a, a sense of paranoia about it. During the reading, Max confronted Chris. Tell us what happened to Lee. And he did. Chris, we just yeah. really need to know, man. I know. Look at me right in my eyes. 
to where is she? I don't know where she where is, is she? right now. You know what happened? I can tell you. You correct. we can tell you. I can no. tell you. I, yeah, I know. Where is she? Chris, please. They're gonna find out, man. They're gonna find out eventually. It's gonna eat you up. They're gonna know what happened. Going to. You know, it already has. you know it's the right thing to do. I know. I won't it. hold grudges. I won't hold it to you, man. We will forgive. I will right. forgive you. Okay. You tell me right now what happened to my sister. You know what happened to my sister. Yes. You have every right to be angry with me for just tell me for lying to you and it's I'm not angry with you yeah. you're about to tell me where my sister is tell us right now <sighs> start talking please I'm trying to find I know just, and just start letting it out man I know it's okay. hard you gotta let it out right now you, I just need to know okay she the first part of my story was right. She did text me and come and asked to come over because she was feeling really depressed. Yeah. We went out and for a while while we were talking. He said she came over, they hung out, sexual relations began. She wouldn't I, do that, dude. She wouldn't do well, that. Chris, stop lying. She wouldn't I'm not do that. Lying. Okay. Keep going, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Keep going, buddy. They had sex, and then he said she asked him for drug money. He said no, and so she came at him with a stabber. And I turned, grabbed her, stepped forward and twisted her around so that her body was in between me and the knife. I placed my hand at her throat. I didn't start squeezing until after she kept going. Said, we can end this right now. I won't say anything to anyone, just please drop the knife. She said that she would stop when either she was dead or if I agreed to buy her drugs. I started squeezing on her throat and I ended up cutting her and I dropped her. I, she landed on the floor. I turned her over to check and make sure she was still alive. And I checked the pulse and didn't find anything. Where'd you put her body? Where's your body? I'll get to that. Just please okay. let me finish from... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I did the only thing I could think of, and God help me, I put her in the dumpster. Heck, I... I... I wouldn't have believed it if I had told it to me. I will be turning myself in to the police. I will tell them... No, you're going to jail right now. You think I'm just going to let you walk away and drive away? You killed my sister. <laughs> At this point, Max jumped over the table and started beating the ever-living shite out of Chris, which I think we can all agree is well-deserved. Hope we got some good digs in. They then forced Chris to call 911 and confess. Confess he did. 911? Uh, yes, I'd like to confess to a murder. Okay. The case is for the... Is into the disappearance of Lee Porter. Chris called 911, but the cops were already there, watching and arrested him. Right now, the search tonight for the body of Lee Porter. Her high school friend is sitting behind bars linked to her murder. Christopher Wade turned himself in to Westminster Police last night. Police searched his apartment twice and today sectioned off part of a public landfill in connection with the case. Uh, we have some good leads on where Leah's at, so we're out uh, looking for Leah. We want to bring her home to her family. He was arrested then, and the police would search and search and search the dump. Uh, the dump, Chris, you know, Chris, he said he put her body in the bin, must have been taken to the dump. I mean, her stuff was found there, so her body should be near. But it wasn't. Lee Porter has never been found. That was his story anyway. Uh, many people, including Misha, do not think that is true. It's He pulled it ugh, out of his arse. He could have buried her anywhere in the surrounding lands. Colorado is a big state with a lot of empty. 
She could be anywhere. Now, the family of Lee Porter says they are not getting the closure they want after their, after their daughter was murdered. Excuse me. The man who says he killed her, Christopher Wade, did agree today to a plea bargain that will send him to prison for 48 years. And so, with nobody, Christopher took a plea deal and accepted a second degree murder conviction. He got 48 years in prison. He will be in his 50s by the time he's up for parole. His story is obviously so full of shit, but it's the only one we have. And so, until otherwise, or Lee's body is found, uh, it had to be taken as the truth. And even to this day, the Porter family is still searching for her. They, as I do, think he is making it up. His story is a complete bollocks. There were reports, there were witnesses. Uh, Chris's neighbors said that on the night of the 3rd of June, early on the 4th of June, probably around the same time he was getting, you know, the bleach and the gloves, a van was seen parked outside his house. Not his van. They believe Chris may have had help disposing of Lee's body, somewhere in the vast Colorado mountains and woods. Multiple searches were done, but nothing located. Um, not yet, anyway. To date, anyway. And Chris is in prison where he belongs, looking like an absolute psycho. And Lee is still out there. Who knows if she will be found. It's an amazing story, though, of a brother, you know, getting his sister's killer to confess to what he did. It's, it's un unbelievable. Unfortunately, what he said happened is about as believable as this. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you taking the time to be here with this guy. Um, hope you found this video interesting. Um, as always, you know, you can check me out on Twitter and on Instagram. You can subscribe. You can do all the things. Or just scream Mike at the TV. I'll see you soon. All right. Here, listen. Please take care of yourselves. Go on. And remember, I love you. Mike out.